Welcome to today's lecture. <laughs> this is coming to you live from whatever room we're in. Um, we are not in the external room, whatever, whatever that was going to be. Uh, that's interesting. That's supposed to go away. Fine. Um, so today, our, our master plan is that we're going to go through this lecture 45 minutes to an hour or something like that. Um, and, and this is, in some sense, my favorite lecture of the whole thing. Uh, I really like this topic, and you'll see why in a little bit. So this is the most fun of the entire, entire lecture. So I had to come here just to do this lecture. Um, and then tomorrow, we, will t we have a few more papers to talk about. But after this lecture today, if anybody's got project things they want to talk about, I'll be here in person so we can chat. Okay. So let's get going. Um, so in the grand sweep of this class, we've talked about everything from what a social network is, what social computing is, the sort of fundamentals of social network analysis, what does it mean to have a strong tie, social capital, personal identity. We've talked about a lot of stuff, right? Today we're talking about a specific topic that, that's near and dear to my heart, and that's uh, searching together, right? Uh, and the reason it, it's interesting to me is that uh, I've done some work in this myself, and we'll get to that at the very end. That's not, it's not part of the reading, so you don't know about it yet. Um, but this is my friend Mary Morris, who wrote all the papers today. Um, it was a complete accident that she's my friend, really. It's just I know about her work really well. So this is Mary. Uh, I've known her since she was an undergraduate at Brown University. And yes, her hair really is like that uh, all the time. She started working on this kind of how people can do research projects together quite a while ago. And so one of the themes of today's lecture is about a research course, a research direction of someone's life. And so Mary actually started sort of a classic HCI person many years ago. And then she got onto this topic in about 2006, 2007. And she's carried it forward probably for eight or nine years on the same topic. And we'll see that progression as we go through today. Um, one of the things that came out of it was this book by, uh, by, uh, by Mary Meredith. Well, hmm, that, her name's Mary. <laughs> by Mary and her friend Jamie Tevin. Um, and we have all worked together. We're trying to produce a book but on, on this related topic. But this is really sort of the condensed condensation of her work. So let's get to it. So uh, traditionally, and even until now, search is kind of something you do by yourself. You wash your hands when you're done, right? Um, uh, the idea, though, is that you know, if people are really doing their knowledge work, why is it solitary? I mean, when we program, we program in pairs. When we do any kind of sophisticated collaborative work, like, blue, like architecture or something, we do it in groups. So why is this such a weird aberration? It doesn't matter which browser you use or which search engine you use. It, it's one of these things. So it, like I said, Mary started working on this in about 2006, 2007. And her first paper uh, uh, on this was really this uh, survey of uh, search web search practices. And that came out in 2008. A little bit before that was, um, actually, I have to put it this way. This one came first. This is where the survey was, which was then published in the smaller paper in 2008. But the, per the, paper was, uh, the survey was actually done here, reported here. So we're going to present them in that order, though. And then, uh, I guess, the important point here is this paper then says, oh, I've, I figured out that there's some design principles that are important for people searching together. OK, survey was done in 2000, uh, eight, uh, 2006, reported in 2007. Extraction of design principles. And they built a couple systems, which we're not in the reading, but I'll talk about. Uh, but the one system that we will talk about is this one called CoSearch, which tried to take those design principles and build something that followed them and actually used it and tried to, tried to make it work. We'll see how well that worked out. So let's go back to the survey. The, the whole idea here is that People have been trying to figure out how we can make search 
a collaborative process? How can we work together effectively? So unlike, say, for example, um, uh, shared Google Docs or shared spreadsheets, where it's pretty straightforward to work together, searching is not yet like that. So it's odd. So people want to do this kind of thing. Um, and it's very clear from the survey results and from interviewing people that they really do want to work together. Okay, And we'll see why in a second. Could we build a tool to help them out? Probably. Foreshadowing. I thought this was important in 2005 and 2006. And so I was working on the same problem at the same time. This is part of the reason why you will like it so much. And I will save the surprise ending for the very end of the lecture. But I was doing the same, very similar things at the same time. Of course, even though Mary's my friend, I couldn't exactly tout her that because of competitive reasons. Anyway, you'll see. We all we reconciled everything at the end. Anyway. They then built CoSearch as a way to sort of test out those ideas. OK, so collaborative search, what is it, right? So social search, like social computing, is this sort of spectrum of information seeking behaviors. So I might do some work and then send it to you, and you do some work and send it to him, and so on. That's social search, but that's sequential. What I want to do in collaborative search, like collaborative working is working together at the same time. We want to divide the problem or share intermediate results or something so we get some advantage out of collaborating as opposed to just pipelining the search process. Okay. So the, the current practices, and this is still true, it's true in 2000, 2005, and now, even over the past 17 years, it's been pretty much People working by themselves and maybe sharing a cell phone. You know, so see that? See that? So it's very kind of personal. It's very individual. Or you get, uh, this is technically called, and I'm not making this up, this is technically called over-the-shoulder computing because it's literally over the shoulder. And one of the striking results from all of my research and a lot of other people's research is that this is the way most people learn how to search. You know, you think they come to my classes. No, they don't come to my classes. They watch somebody else do it. And if this person has it wrong, then she gets it wrong, too. So there's a lot of this sort of social sharing, but it's, it's inefficient. It's all tiny. It's all small groups. What can we do? So uh, 2008, like I said, this is actually done earlier. The, the survey was in 2007, but this is the paper from 2008. Um, once you skip all the stuff at the beginning, it boils down to it sampled 109 people, knowledge workers. This is that categorical term, knowledge workers, people at Microsoft, um, or you know when I do the same thing, it's people at Google. It's knowledge, It's whoever's in your company. But, uh, and what they did is they asked people, "Have you ever collaborated on a search problem?" Guess what? 90 percent of them said yes. That doesn't surprise me, right? That doesn't, shouldn't surprise anybody. And of course, here's that first category, watching over someone's shoulder. Yeah, it's a real thing. OK, so 87% of people said that. Or they instant message them as they're working on it. They're dividing it up. That's pretty actually rare. That's like less than 20%. So that's less than one in five. So, um, so that's, in, that's how often people do it. Um, what they do to search on what kind of products they use, they email, they show a personal display, they email a summary, call someone on the phone, they do all these things. There are all these behaviors. But look at the numbers, right? This is super common. Can't we do better? We should be able to do better. Why are we doing this super inefficient thing? So uh, obviously this one, created or posted to a web page, you know, nobody does that, basically. Very small number of people. And remember the bias in the survey. OK, stop for a second over here. Every time you see a survey, you should think, who did they survey? How does this bias the result? Because it biases the result. Right? So for example, one test you should always be keeping in the back of your mind when you do a survey is, suppose I ran the survey again with a different set of 100 people from that same company. Would I get the same results? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. As an example, 
Somebody at work last week ran a sample um, survey with 400 people. The next day, they ran the same survey, exactly the same survey, and got different results. Significant result, like 15% different. Okay? Uh, okay? Lesson number one. For this particular survey sample instrument, 400 people was not enough. There was too much individual variation in the results. So the spread was too big. So they needed to triple that sample size in order to bring it down. So whenever you see a sample, think, is that a repeatable survey? Right. Anyway, I, believe, I actually believe this one. But it's only going to be true from knowledge workers, that is, fairly advanced people. So if you took this and it crossed all of Switzerland, all of Europe, this number is going to be one-tenth that. And sorry, for the recording, I was pointing to the bottom digit on the right-hand side. <laughs> All right. So now this is um, the different kinds, how often people do it, what the frequency is. So how often do you search with, with a friend? Um, so guess what? Uh, yearly, 25% uh, roughly, roughly a quarter. And everything else is like super infrequent. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is one person, right? This is one poor person said they collaborate search daily. They're weird. I mean, they're just different. Because that's such a tiny fraction that something's kind of funny. <clears throat> but the rest of the numbers, I believe. Now, the big question is, for people who do this kind of collaborative search, what are they doing? And these numbers actually align with other numbers that we've done at work at Google. Um, so people traveling, travel, doing travel planning, pretty big thing, shopping tasks, literature search. This is for, no, wait a second. Think about this. Remember I said knowledge workers at Microsoft? The truth is, this is less than a fraction of 1% in reality in the whole population. But among knowledge workers at a university or at a, at a, a software company like Microsoft, a research company, it's going to be fairly large. That's why that number is so big. Again, this is characterizing a particular population. Again, technical information, same sort of thing, so on, so on, so on. This is surprisingly low, medical information. Because lots of people, it, well, in a study I did uh, a couple years ago, I found that roughly half of all search, medical searches are by proxy, meaning they're not for you. They're for your kid. They're for your parents. They're for your cousin. They're for a friend, right? So you might be doing a search about what a black <coughs> spot on your hand means. And it's not actually for you. It's actually for your mother, who doesn't really want to know the answer in case it's scary. Okay? So this is actually, I think, too small a number. Medical information is probably higher. This is particularly true when you're having aging parents or children with complicated medical situations. Because then, you have multiple people all doing searches in parallel on that same topic. So how do I manage uh, elderly onset diabetes? How do I take care of a child with a particular blood disorder? That kind of thing. So, but in general, I think these numbers are pretty right, and they reflect the kinds of complex tasks that people want to do search for information for. So that's what's going on here. Lots of travel planning. You can't believe how much travel planning goes on. Uh, and a lot of this, we found, was entire families or extended families trying to coordinate a trip to somewhere. So where are we going to go to Italy? Let's go to Venice. No, I don't want to go to Venice. I want to go to Rome. No, let's not go to Rome. I want to go to Sicily. Right? And so you get lots of people fighting back and forth about that. So um, this was just an aside. And uh, Mary actually did this. This data collection in 2012, so this is much later, from a workshop. Uh, about the same sample size, about the same response rate. Um, this is slightly higher than from 2006. <coughs> this is in the past month. So this has gone up a little bit. I predict that by now this number has gone up even more. So this is now 2017. I'm willing to bet that this number is more like 75%. Point, this is a common behavior for which we still don't have decent tools. So this is, a, I think, a valid research topic. And we still don't have great stuff for it. 
So um, remember that frequency numbers we saw earlier? So now it's 50% at least once a week. Uh, that's doubled since 2006, so that's a big change. Again, in the past, you know, add five years to this, and it's probably gone up to 75%. So if anybody's looking for a thesis topic, this is a good one, because there's lots of room here. So that was the survey paper, and a little bit more. Okay, So let's talk about this. The second paper, um, like I said, really came first, but it makes sense here, because this basically reproduces the survey results and adds the analysis. <coughs> and the analysis basically is that what people lo are looking for in a collaborative search tool are these four properties. They want to parallelize the tasks. So you do that, you do that, you do that, right? We allocate the subtask, which we'll then have to merge at some point. There's problems in helping your remote collaborators navigating these same things. For example, suppose we were all working on a shared search problem, and I was in Mountain View, California. It's a nine-hour time difference between here and there. And trust me, I'm trying to work with people in Mountain View right now, and that time difference is a big hassle. It's a huge hassle. Now let's add people in Japan. Uh, so that, so what? The, this distribution of partial results or intermediate results is a real hassle. What's also true is that people often don't know what to share. So for example, if we're working on a problem, how do I know that you've already searched this thing? Or you have or we need to, you know, I've already done this, so here, you know, don't bother doing it. So just staying informed about the state of other collaborators is hard. And lastly, um, not everybody who's collaborating has the same level of search skill. So, you know, if you've done a search on, say, juvenile onset diabetes, did you really get it done right? How would I know? So it's difficult for all, this, all of us to get on the same page. So the implications that they draw in this paper are for all of these tasks, the travel tasks, the shopping tasks, the medical tasks, and the planning, party planning tasks, we need a search interface, a search system that has persistence, awareness, and division of labor. That's basically solutions for the problems we just identified. So, remember now, this is now 2007, 2008. Mary says, oh, what can I do? I can build a system that makes all that explicit. Over at Google, I'm saying, what can I do? I can build a system that makes all that explicit. But we're talking about Mary's paper. So um, this is the, the, one of the systems they built. Now, this is part, I don't know, two or three in the chain of stuff, pieces of research they did. So this is their system that takes account of that stuff we just identified from the previous survey. Okay? That's the reason you do that kind of research. That's called formative research. And it's identifying what the problems are. Surveys are one way to do that, but another way to do that is usability studies. Okay, so we could have a whole course on just that. But basically, you're trying to identify the core issues, the key problems that people have when trying to achieve this obviously good thing to do. Okay, so here's what happened. So this is really a story, like I said, of what Mary did over the past decade on this problem. And these kinds of group research tasks, um, and I wish I could find the video. I, I'll try again. If I find it tonight, I'll, I'll send it out to everybody so you can watch the video. Uh, they have this nice discussion of what treatment um, their parents should have for uh, late onset diabetes. So it's, it's, <laughs> So suppose we're all members of a large family. Our mom has diabetes. OK, what are we going to do? Right? Because it's complicated. And if I'm in California, our search process is a lot weirder and more difficult. Right? That's, a, that's the kind of thing we want to do. Um, again, family vacations. Or for research purposes, it's often the case that I have these kinds of discussions with my colleagues. Say, I often will write a paper with people in New York. Or right now, I'm working on a paper with somebody in Denmark. 
or a paper with somebody in, say, Los Angeles. So they're all distributed geographically. And this is a very common question. And this is a question I've had, conversation I've had with some of you. What kind of analysis should you be doing on your data set? Right. And often we'll bring in a, statistic, a statistical expert who will say, oh, you need Krushka Wallace, or you need Kawasaki's, or whatever, right? You need this kind of treatment. But this is the kind of research conversations that go on. And it's the kind of story that, that they want to support. So remember, this paper is about co-search. So I want to start with a, their very first system that they, that they built called Team Search. Because like I said, they started about 2005, 2006, trying to solve this collaborative search problem. So Mary and her colleagues, um, so this is uh, Mary and Andreas Papti and, and Terry Winograd, built this system to allow people to sort photographs, say family photographs, around a big table display like this. Okay, So I went over and watched them using this uh, over at Stanford. And basically what you've got is, well, here you are. We have four of us. We're sitting around this table. And we've got this pile of photographs in the center, and we want to sort it out. We may be able to do a query to find something. Find me all the pictures with John in it. Find all the pictures of us at the vacation in Italy. And you can basically then move these things around and sort them. It's, it's really a sense-making task, where sense-making means you've got a lot of data. You want to figure it out. You want to make some kind of organized sense out of it. Fine. So, um, the circular widgets, these things right here, are what each person creates to represent their categorization of the photos. So I can drag this guy in here and say this family, that one's into recipe, and so on. Each, each one of the four of us can do that. The size represents how many photographs are in that. So Tom over here has not done very many. This is, you can actually take a photograph and drag it down there. It's kind of a temporary buffer. So that's the interaction. And what happens is that people can sit around and do this kind of thing and try to organize their photographs. Fine. Kind of a pain. It's much easier just to have real photographs and do it this way. So it was a great demonstration system, but it illustrated a couple points. First off, that group awareness of the current state of the processing was really useful. Second, you need a good search tool. The search tool they had was not that great. So, all right. They publish a paper, they get done, fine. Let's do it again. Let's do it right. Okay? So they built another system called Search Together. This is Mary Morris again and Eric Horvitz, who's now the head of research for, for Microsoft, a long-time AI guy. So they want to do searches where people can work together synchronously or asynchronously to support the Dan in California problem. Uh, so they have this spectacular photograph. Uh, and what they built was the system with multiple panes in it. So here's a big search box. Here's the messages box and so on. Here's some labels so you can see what's going on. So here is the actual search session. Now notice something just by way of thinking about this as social computing. See this is Sharota Paul. This is her right there. Remember that name. It's going to go back. She's not a co-author on the paper, but she's important. Okay, but this is where you do your searches. So um, the task here is to find something fun to do in, in Seattle. Uh, so this is the search that she's run. This is the history of the searches she's done. Remember, this is all for Sharota. Here, we can add comments onto individual web pages. So as Sharoda is working away through these things, she might find and leave a comment, which is then implicitly attached to the page, uh, uh, which is, I guess it's this one, the one under, under description. So see this? This is Sharoda's work in her query history. This is Mary's work. So they're working asynchronously. If they were alive together, you would see, um, uh, I guess Sharota is offline, but Mary's online. She's got the little footprints in there. 
Okay, so she's actually active right now. But Sharoda is in green, Mary's in gray, she's online. She could be online, but if she goes offline, Mary can still see her stuff. Get it? And then down here, you can have real-time chat with your collaborators. So it's kind of got it all. It's got chat, it's got query history, it's got the ability to switch between views of all this stuff. Cool, right? So it's got lots of things in it. It's got session summary, group, group queries, integrated chat, ratings. It's kind of got everything you could think about. You could come over here, and this is a summary of her work. You could see that. Very nice. So what happened with that? So pause for a second. In the background of all this work is a theoretical construction called sense making. Sense making is how people put together, understand large bodies of information. Say, like trying to do something fun in Seattle, like the previous task. Or say, planning a treatment of diabetes for an elderly mom. Okay? So sense making is something I've worked on since, this is me, 93. Uh, been a few other pieces of work since then. Uh, and this was exactly an attempt to build a sense making tool, which is now you see why I'm so interested in it. I've been interested in sense making for before some of you were born. And it's the kind of thing that actually drives a lot of my research. So, interesting part of this, it has always been historically individual behaviors. So people draw diagrams like this trying to make concept maps, or they make giant walls of stickies trying to build affinity maps. It's all this working in, in individual. So in about the same time, people started studying sense making in parallel, people making sense in groups. And so there's been a lot of work since then. And in many ways, Search Together was the first real system to do that. So this is the first collaborative sense-making system I've seen. And since then, we've seen other work in this area. <coughs> Recognize that name? That's Shroda. She wrote, uh, her, this was a, a piece of a work that she did in 2010. And, and it's based on her PhD thesis, which was collaborative sense-making in 2009. So these folks are all working on it. And again, we see this is actually the same problem, organizing, in this case, pieces of paper with people around a table. But now in 2010, they stopped trying to do it all electronically. They were just watching people with real physical pieces of paper trying to understand what they would do naturally. Surprise, surprise, there was all kinds of stuff that people do in reality that they had not modeled on the online version. For example, it's hard to see this, this photograph here, but you've got these pieces of paper, and people will stack these pieces of paper like this. So here's my stack, and I'm going to take this stack, and I'm going to overlay it. Oh, how do you do that online? Suppose I want to then rotate that by 10 degrees to indicate that it's currently under process. See what I'm saying? There's all these externalities that we're very good at when dealing with physical objects. We encode properties in this kind of stuff. And we forgot to build that into our online tools. So this is the right kind of study to do. And I, I completely believe in it because <coughs> I, I did a bunch of studies like this too. OK? So. From this whole body work and now coming out of search together, we realize that the sense-making challenges are, again, trying to be aware of what's going on. So for example, if I'm talking to Sharoda and she says, yeah, I, I searched for that thing that, on diabetes, versus I searched for that thing on diabetes. Okay, There's a bunch of additional information there which is not represented in the text. Right, just in the tone of my voice and body posture and so on. So context awareness is more than just bits of text. It can be other things as well. When we watch people actually trying to make sense, we see these steps, steps in the sense-making process, which often encode, again, additional information. This person is walking, but if they were running, we would see a different pattern. And you can see, in the best systems, a sharing of that kind of information as well. And then uh, this third thing came up, uh, sense-making handoffs. 
This was not ever highlighted until about uh, 2000, 2004 or so. And I had a student, uh, Nikhil Sharma, at the University of Michigan, who studied this explicitly and discovered that when people are working in teams, it's often a big deal to share the state of your sense-making process with the next team. It's a little bit like working in a hospital. When you've got a patient coming into the emergency room, they're crashing and they're in terrible state. Doctor, nurse takes care of them, and then they have to go home because they're done with their shift. They have to take all that information and hand it off to the next team. So that's the handoff problem. And it happens all the time. So another system was built to try to solve some of these problems. This is another work by, by Mary and, and team called CoSense. Um, basically, CoSense is an additional package that links together with an intermediate database to search together. So you've got search together, and they said, look, we're having problems understanding the state that people are in when they're working on these shared sense-making tasks. Okay. So what they did is they decided to take search together and add a bunch of views onto the data set. So these are search strategies views, so I can see what you're doing. I see you're going to pursue insulin therapies, or you're going to pursue dietary therapies, whatever. So I can see that partly through strategies, partly through time, partly through workspace, what items you have on your workspace, and a, a chat-centric view. So here's a search strategies view. So uh, this is, you, it's a little hard to see, but these are all labeled with names. So big key, the color matches the person. Green is Morgan, red is Gary, and so on. So these are one, two, three, four different work products views. And up here we have sort of the overall view, the total number of URLs that people have searched for. So we can see Ilya is not doing much work. And over here we have uh, just a summary of, uh, of the current status of all these people. This is called the web uh, search strategies view. They also have a timeline view. So you can see who's doing what when. Again, the red codes to which the individuals are. So I can see what that Ilya, Ilya, he never appears in here, right? But the other people are working hard. We also have the workspace view, where this is basically a collection of notes that this person, uh, I guess it's Gary, has been putting together. This is somebody else's workspace. It's kind of like a notepad. Oh, yeah. Note taking. What a good idea. Remember that. Good idea. And they added a chat centric view. OK, now, you should be thinking about this point. Ay, 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 that's a lot of stuff. Because remember, these are all in on top of search together. Right? Let's search together, and we've got these four different views. So um, the evaluation, they did an evaluation here of CoSense. Um, it improved it. Um, in this formative study, they did the task of vacation planning. They had 18 people. They did the search together plus cosense. Um, and they did you know, standard interview observations on an online questionnaire. So this is, uh, this is how it was used, right? There's the synchronous part where people were doing this live. The asynchronous part, knowing what you did when I was you know, goofing around. There was a big questionnaire where we where uh, Mary and her team asked people what the contributions were of each of these views. OK, you're trying to evaluate this big thing. How are you going to do it? So they collected it. They did a bunch of observations. So they bring people in. They watch them working. They then look at the log data, and they do this uh, after-use after questionnaire. So I will tell you, bottom line, it's too big and too complicated. Okay? So yes, people who are highly motivated will come in your lab and do, they will work like hell and they will get stuff down and they will never go do it in reality. So this is a huge, huge problem for our field. It's very tempting to build absolutely everything into your system and when you bring people in, think about this. They've come into the lab at Microsoft. I'm a Microsoft participant. 
I'm going to work really, really hard to show you that your system works well. So there's a huge bias effect. Then when you take this out in the real, real world, people tend to say, oh, man, my show is on TV at 9 o'clock. i got to get done, right? So people tend to minimize the amount of work they spend. Even though they know it's good for them, it's, it, it tends to try to look for the minimum. So, yeah, it works, but, okay, now, they recognized that this is big and overkill. So they said, okay, let's do something dead simple. We want people to work together. We want to minimize the overhead. We want to maximize the awareness. So we're going to build one computer, one system, and we're going to have, well, you get a mouse, and 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 you get different colors on the cursors. So it's a, an end mouse system. So you, everybody gets a mouse. And then we can all work together on a display like this. So you see, this is a lot like a simplified cosense, right? So this is like search together, kind of cut down. So what we've got is a query queue where people can do queries. Again, color matches to individuals. So you're orange, you're green, you're blue, right? And I get to drive. There's one person who runs the keyboard, okay? So what you can do with your cursor is you can say, hey, let's click on this and see what happens. Click, and it opens up a new tab, color-coded by person, right? And what happens is you get social, real-time organization behavior. Okay? Stop it, Terry. Don't do that. All right? Or, John, would you click on the blue? Right, that kind of thing. So you get real-time. So this is not distributed at all. This is not asynchronous. This is real-time synchronous, intended to be used primarily by, um, in, in classrooms. So at this point, their focus is shifting towards people who have to work together on programming assignments or in classrooms to solve class problems. Guess where this is going to go, all right? So they didn't know at the time. They thought, well, we are responding to what we found in the last study, which was don't build it too big and too complicated. Let's make it straightforward. What do we do? Okay. So they wanted to really address this problem of awareness, okay? Because in the previous one, there's a lot of asynchronous behavior that nobody ever saw. So John did all of his work, and I never saw it. So the awareness problem becomes critical. They wanted to um, also include a bunch of rich, real-time collaboration features. So they had these things like the queue. Remember that? <coughs> this is the query queue. So I could put up a, queue up, uh, a query up here that I want the driver to run in the future. When you get around to it, would you please do that query for me? Okay. So they have this query queue. Um, you can take notes and all this jazz, right? Think about that for a second. You can take notes. How do you take notes? Who's got the keyboard? The driver has the keyboard. All right. So there's only one guy who has the keyboard. So you can kind of see where this is going to go. Um, so they did their study. Um, and this is an interesting pragmatic problem. They had three tasks, ecological tasks, that is appropriate for the people in the setting. So the setting was the schoolroom, students. So they had school tasks. Like, uh, tell me about the history of the Seven Years' War, or whatever. Okay? Now, this sounds stupid. The maximum of seven minutes per task. But every study we have done and everybody else has done shows that seven minutes is about the upper limit for realistic time on task. Maybe not for your tasks, but for most people, seven minutes is a lot. So they gave them um, these three tasks, gave them seven minutes each. And if you're running a study, you don't like it to run more than a couple of hours. So by the time you bring in your students, get them set up, run through a, 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 a training, get the NDA signed, get them all organized, and start your first task, it's 45 minutes into two hours, right? So then you've got 21 minutes, over, and you get a little break, and that's two hours. So that's, that's the, what they did. They found that not very many groups could finish. Even given their seven minutes, they needed like 15. 
the U lock twice as much. Okay, so um, what they also did was compare three different conditions. There's using co-search. There's parallel, which is you get a computer, you get a computer, you get a computer. That's a parallel session, right? And you have to talk to each other. And then there's shared, which is the three of you all have one computer, but there's nothing else on it. It's just a browser. So that's the three conditions. Which do you think would be best in order to get the maximum amount of work done? Any guesses? Remember, they went to a lot of trouble to build this system. They want this one to win. Right? Which do you think would be the best condition? Parallel? You think so? Oh, man. You guys could save these people a lot of work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you the result here in a second. Um, here are the findings. Um, guess what? All conditions facilitate group communication and collaboration. Yay! Okay. However, 15 participants chose parallel as their favorite. So you're right. Um, 11 chose co-search and 7 chose shared. Now, it, the paper says it's not st significantly different. However, remember, they know that they've come in to test this system, co-search, right? Despite that huge biasing effect, 15 of them chose the parallel condition as their favorite. So in reality, I'm willing to bet it's half that. So this is probably five, this is probably seven, or whatever the remainder would be, okay? And so the parallel condition where each person has their own computer dominates. Partly, you know how to use it, right? You don't have to learn anything. You don't have to negotiate like you would in the shared condition. So that makes sense. Interestingly, when they did their post-survey, there were no differences in perceived communication between the groups, between these three different groups. However, there was a heightened sense of being ignored in the co-search condition. Oh, damn. Yeah, so what happened was you had a driver who was choosing which queries to run. And what happened is that if you had a blue cursor and you made, you know, like, uh, forget about it. And so they got ignored. Anybody who didn't have a keyboard was kind of ignoring. Question? Did they try the not only multiple minds, but also multiple keyboards? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Give me a second. <laughs> you're, you're, you, you've it's looked ahead. Logical. It's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's right. You'll see why. Um, anyway, these queued things were ignored. Half of the driver queries were executed, but only around 10%. It's like, yeah, of course you feel ignored. You are ignored. OK, um, so uh, again, the shared condition, being aware when you tested that, the shared condition where you're all sharing one computer, of course you're more aware, right? You can't not be aware. Um, and that be but that beats cosense, and cosense is about the same as parallel. Drivers felt more active, no outcome differences. Nothing. Partly because not many people completed all the tasks. But overall, there's no quality difference. So huge intervention, no outcome. That's not great. Um, in particular, they had this note-taking capability. Point, that's terrible, right? Per session. So this totally flopped, completely flopped. So the big takeaway here is that, yeah, you get better communication in the cosense uh, in that in there for parallel, but you know, uh, parallel uh, totally wins overall. You have fewer frustrations, you have better awareness, and so yeah, just give people computers, right? So in some sense, this is a brave paper because they spent a lot of time responding to the results of the previous paper, and it totally didn't work. So we had three papers that kind of don't work in a row. Which tells me people want this, but they don't know how to build it. So I'll get back to your question here in a second. Right? So this was not in your reading list, but this is the next one they built. Right? These people do not give up. So this is uh, Mary Morris again, uh, my friend Mary Shawinsky, and uh, Nima Moraveji, who was my intern at Google 
And we wrote a really fantastic paper together, not on this at all, totally separate. Oh, that's a whole separate story. But they built the next system, which was class search. And guess what? It's what you asked for, right? Multiple students search, and they could each use their own laptop. Cool. That's kind of where you should have started, right? But this was, you know, this is what, uh, 2011. This is now, what, four or five years after they started the original research. So it's always not a straight line. It's always not obvious. It's obvious to us now looking backwards. But believe me, in two, I, was, I was there in 2005. It was not obvious. Right. So what they did is they realized, oh, let's do multiple students. Let's allow students to contribute or not. Allow people to have visualization aids and so on and so on. Right. So let's build this system. Again, targeting classrooms. But the key difference. Each student now has their own laptop, and they're all working on pieces of the problem. So we can do voice allocation. Barbara in the back row, you work on King James. Steve in the front row, you work on the, the, the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, so we all can work on this. And then, and then, why is it out of focus? It's really weird. At any rate, um, we have a shared display now. Where what we have, it's a little hard to see. I don't know why it's so hard to see. But um, what we have here are tag clouds. We have an article. So this is one person now driving the display. We have one article. This person is working on Marco Polo. We have a tag cloud of places they visited. And this is the important part. A tag, this is actually a set of queries that this person did. Over here, we see all the students. You can't read their names, but they're there. Those are students in the classroom. So the teacher can go, John, let's see what you've done. And it shows up. Okay. There's also another, uh, it's not on here. There's another button up there which says, let's look at all the queries that everybody's doing. So now, suppose we're all working on Marco Polo. Okay. Let's look at all the, the queries collected and all the sites collected and get rid of that. So we just see these two panels side by side. Turns out that works really well. Because for the first time, I can see in synchronous time what you've been doing to search this topic. And I say, oh yeah, Jones query, that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that too. And so we start to see convergence of searches along paths that are really effective and efficient. So finally, they got something that's starting to work. So um, here's an example. This is one of the query clouds. So here, uh, this was, I forget what the problem was, but you can see different versions of the, the queries. Uh, this one, volcano safety, one person thought of that, and that turns out to be really effective. So once it becomes visible, it's visible to everybody simultaneously. And we can see sites. Um, this particular one is good, again, because until you, somebody points out that USGS is the big geological site in the US, you might not have thought about that. So all of a sudden, again, it's very effective real-time sharing of knowledge about how to proceed with the sense-making task. So um, from my perspective, this worked really well. Students were able to be effective. Teacher could see what was going on. It actually made you know, people got stuff done, which was a real improvement over the last one. Right? Um, but the, the instructors and the students sort of wanted some objective version of how well they were doing. I want to know that you took four queries, and he took eight. So I you get a C, you get an A. They wanted something like that, and that's sort of unfortunate. But um, so they didn't. They didn't continue past that. Anyway, um, that got published, and that was 2011. There was a little bit more work in 2012, 2013, but that team has mostly moved off that topic now. So that was like 10 years of work. It was a nice, bright thread of work. And the reason, again, like I was so interested in it was that at the same time, about 2006, we started working on a Google Notebook. I, I feel bad. I never, 
I wrote one small paper on this, but uh, we did basically all the same stuff. What we were trying to do was to give you a notebook that was integrated to Google Search. That means you could do your search, and if you found a great result, you could click down a button that was next to the result, it'll automatically copy that result and the snippet into your notebook. So it was great. Bang! And I could share my notebook with you, and you could structure your stuff, and we could move things around. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, it got delaunched in 2011. It was removed. Um, taken over by Google Docs. Now, the hook is no longer there. That is, Google Docs is a separate thing, but it's got a great sharing model. It's much more flexible than what we built. This was what it, I, I realize this now. We didn't know this at the time. This was the predecessor to Google Docs. So uh, we got patents and all kinds of stuff on this, but we didn't think of it as Google Docs. We thought of it as a sense-making shared notebook. Someone else comes along and says, oh, you just mean notebook. OK, I guess. Right? And that's the way science and technology and development sometimes work. So um, this is no longer available. It's uh, now in the archives of history. I have all my notebooks as Google Docs. And I share them with all the same people. And we don't use this so much for, um, for classes anymore as much as we do just for getting regular work done. All right, does that all make sense? So that's the history of, of that sort of sh uh, shared collaborative search thing. Lots of people I know now use IPython notebooks to do collaborative work. Now, it's not quite the same as a search process, but for certain kinds of tasks, it's really nice. Really nice. Because you can actually say, here's the code that runs this analysis and the data set, so it's all in one. So that's, in many ways, I think, where the future of this is kind of going. Much more active notebooks along the lines of MATLAB or IPython. OK, so that's the, that's the, the lecture for today. I want to wrap up with one, one quick comment, which is uh, this is the rest of this week. So uh, today, uh, uh, we're going to have Whoever wants to stick around afterwards, we can just sit and chat about this thing. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have our, our meeting again here at 4 o'clock, and we'll be talking about um, the shortest path to happiness. How can you possibly miss this lecture? Right? I'll tell you what the shortest path to happiness is. Um, so we'll do that tomorrow. Uh, we'll look at tweets from Justin Bieber, and we'll talk about tweets in general. Uh, so this is uh, a nice sort of way to stop because the Twitterverse, as you probably have noticed, has been deeply, deeply important in the U.S. in the past year or two. Uh, and it's kind of social computing gone wild. So we'll talk about some of that tomorrow. And then on Friday, we'll have our presentations. Uh, I'll send out a note uh, with, again, reminding people about the, the shared document. A lot of people have already put in their slides, which is great. So I think we're going to have a good, good time. Another uh, quick comment is we have one team that's presenting in this at the end of the day tomorrow because they, they've got a flight to catch and they're worried that they're not going to catch their flight. So I said, sure, go on Thursday. If any other team needs to do that, let me know now and <laughs> we'll negotiate it. Okay? Great. I'm going to stop the recording.